Hello and a big welcome to the VUCA audience and the VUCA podcast of 2022. My name is Oresia Nyawade and I will be hosting us today. It's been a while since we've been in your ears and I just want all of us to please understand that we've worked, we've been working very hard in the background to bring you the best stories, um, lessons, insights from African businesses, brands and everyday leaders. The topic that we will be kickstarting this year with is the metaverse. Everybody's talking about it. What's going on there? We'll be covering crypto and NFTs and all things virtual living and investing. The EMAG is set to be released on Monday, 28th of March, 2022. So head on to our website, www.vuka.com and subscribe to stay up to date with all future issues. And to help us bring this topic to life, we have a very special guest with us today. Her name is Karabo Murule. She is the co-founder of Capital Art, which launched in December 2020. Capital Art is the first art collection management service focused on collectors of modern and contemporary African art. Carabo is an actuary by profession with experience in the investing, investment banking industry. She's been collecting, investing in, and being a patron of the arts since 2012. She is a member of the World Economic Forum's Young Global Leaders, and in 2014, she was recognized as one of the 200 young South African leaders who are shaping the country's future. Karabo, welcome. Good morning. How are you doing today? Good, good morning, Orisia. I'm really good, and it's such a great privilege to be here, um, and hope you're well as well. I am well, <laughs> and I'm very, very excited and honored to have you as our first guest I would love to hear about that awesome work you're doing at Capital Art. When I see the word first, I get excited. So <laughs> why don't you give us a little bit of background on the work that you're doing at Capital Art? Yeah. So, yeah, and to, um, you know, I my background, like you say, I'm an actually by profession. Um, you know, worked in investment banking for five years. Um, most of that was actually in insurance securitized products. And I was based in London, which is one of the financial centers of the world from 2006 to 2009. Um, but actually London, of course, is also a very big art destination, you know. So um, especially towards uh, as the global financial crisis was rolling through and, you know, work was drying up. Then I decided, actually, let me go and spend a bit more time in some of these galleries that previously I never had time to attend because we were working till like 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night, mm. you know, every day. Um, and um, and also just, you know, hang out with some friends who obviously had a very big interest in art because they were maybe more exposed to it. Um, but it was really wonderful to go and see, um, you know, all these interesting exhibitions um, and to go see, you know, be at the Tate Modern or be at the British Museum and the Portrait Gallery um, and experience those arts and get introduced to sometimes some South African artists through friends. Um, so Robin Ridder is a big South African artist who's been based in Germany, but had a big exhibition there. Um, and it was fascinating to then, you know, be in a gallery and it's Robin Ridder's work. But then you see this really cool um, set of four paintings and it looks like it's a turntable with a record on it. And you see on the side and it says, this piece is part of the private collection of Sean Carter being Jay-Z, the big musician, <laughs> the rapper who is so well known. And you're like, wow, okay, there's people who are collecting this type of art, that's amazing. Um, but yeah, so I left London um, and then from 2010 to 2020, um, I came back to South Africa and I joined um, a big life insurance, large financial services company, but I was working in the personal finance business unit. And my last role was actually as the managing director for that business unit. Um, but all those things, I think, um, you know, helped me to just think about like assets from a personal finance perspective. And then you start to realize that art is not really catered for in thinking about it as an asset class. And there's a lot of collectors who collect art because they like how it looks. You know, we all need to appreciate the cultural value of art and look after it for generations to come. But the problem the startup is solving is 
to help collectors maximize the value of their art portfolios by helping them manage their art collections more efficiently. So in the same way that you, if you're an investor, with you've got a unit trust or a mutual fund, you get a report from your asset manager every three to six months telling you what's been the performance of these investments that you have. And I think we should be thinking about doing the same thing when it's happening with your art collection as well. And in particular, making sure that also that value is reflected accurately in your insurance policies. So being an actor, I obviously have to talk about insurance. <laughs> and, uh, and that's really what the startup is doing. And um, it's great, you know, yes, there's some other art collection platforms which are there. Um, you know, some of them sometimes just focus on institutional collectors. So this is corporate collections, you know, Anglo-American or Standard Bank will have a corporate collection, um, you know, makes up also a portion of their balance sheet and they use it to diversify their assets as well, but also obviously be a patron of the arts. Um, in Europe and in North America, you have some platforms which are then doing what we do. Sometimes they just focus on collection management. Um, we found that not many would co uh, combine the collection management as well as give you an updated estimated value for your art collection. Um, but a lot of them, when you go there, if you want to add an artwork, it's only in pounds or US dollars or Japanese yen. Nothing is there for you if you want to add something that you bought in Nigerian Naira or Kenyan shillings or South African rand. So, you know, that's also one of the key things which is there is that you will find the artists that you are collecting um, and it's very um, catered towards kind of really the collectors of African art be they anywhere in the world but that said actually the, the platform can be used by anybody so yes if you are a collector of you know people or you're a collector of Banksy or you're a collector of Miro, Picasso whoever it is um, anywhere around the world you could actually use the platform as well Carabo Thank you so much for that. Like in the few minutes that you have spoken, I feel like I have already learned so much. Um, here's Jay-Z using art as investment. He sings about it in his songs, raps about it in his okay. songs. And then, mm -hmm. I mean, we have all these amazing artists in, in Africa. I mean, we are creatives by nature. And then you've introduced yeah. me to this whole other world of collectors. What, yeah. who, who's serving them? And what about these African collectors? How are we using art as a form of investment? And the work that you're doing, you know, to help us with the valuation and personal financing and just tracking, it's, it's brilliant. And big up yourself and your team. I'm very excited for what more great stuff you guys will be doing. Awesome. Thank you so much. So let's... Speaking of art, there's a real, real buzzword, buzz space uh, happening globally right now. And that's the NFT space, which I feel like is just perfect for artists, collectors. But it also is a space that people don't quite understand. And, and it is my understanding that it's a space that you and your team will soon or are already looking to play into. So the NFT virtual space, right? What, what, what are NFTs and how can we link it back to art? Yeah. So NFT stands for non-fungible token. Um, and I guess also, yeah, you know, when we talk about non-fungible, some people are not really used to kind of what does that word mean? So when something is fungible, it means kind of they're interreplaceable. It's the same as like, um, money is typically um, understood to be a fungible asset in the sense that if you have five two rand coins in your pocket, South African rands, and I have a 10 rand note, um, there are different things, right? One is five coins, one is one note. Mm -hmm. But actually, because they're exactly, because the rand is fungible, I can give you my 10 rand note, you can give me the five two rands, and it's exactly the same value. So that's kind of when you have something which is a fungible asset. Mm -hmm. um, when it's non-fungible, it means I can't switch what you have for what I have. I have to have a mechanism for exchanging them um, or translating what the value of what you have, which is quite unique with what I have, what might be money, and then express that as an exchange um, in that way. So that's what NFT stands for. It's a non-fungible token. Yeah. And an NFT is a digital asset on a blockchain that is unique and cannot be replaced by another digital asset. So this is where also NFTs are different to cryptocurrency, you know. Um, if I have uh, one Bitcoin, I can switch that to 
0.2 of a Bitcoin and give you 5.2s of a Bitcoin, it's the same. It still adds up to one Bitcoin. Yeah. But with NFTs, it's not. It's unique and it cannot be replaced by another digital asset. So effectively, it is code using cryptographic software on distributed ledger technology that manifests in the form of digital art or collectibles, a creative extension of music or a synergy of all three or something which is entirely new or some unexplored compositions. And the idea of NFTs actually emerged from what was called like a colored coin, in inverted commas, um, initially used on the Bitcoin um, blockchain between yeah, 2012 and 2013, from what I checked up mm -hmm. on it. And, and colored coins kind of are tokens that represent this real world assets on the blockchain. And that was kind of the idea was that one could use these colored coins to prove ownership of any asset, be it precious metals or cars, real estate, or even financial assets like equities and bonds. Um, so, yeah, although not as sophisticated as we use kind of them today, kind of that was the original idea for the Bitcoin blockchain for assets um, like digital collectibles, but coupons, property, company shares and more. And I think the big thing that um, the great characteristic that everybody talks about when they're talking about blockchain in the context of art, mm -hmm. um, blockchain in general is that it's decentralized. But also in, in its application to art is that there are artists who feel like NFTs free them from the intermediaries in the art ecosystem who in their eyes are blocking them from accessing the ecosystem for whatever reason. So that's, I think, one of the big drivers of, of why um, there's quite a big gravitation of people who are artists into NFTs. But another important aspect um, in the art world in general is that it helps a lot to be able to trace back an artwork from the first owner or who received it from the original creator um, to the current previous owner if you want to buy it. But also the art market is fraught with people who are trying to make a quick buck by creating fraudulent pieces which are not original and then selling them to people who have an interest in art but might not have the expert knowledge to know a real one from a fake version. And, you know, for those who are interested in this, you might want to watch the movie called Made You Look on Netflix because it's about, like, the scenario that happened in real life and you can kind of get a sense of um, kind of this issue of kind of the, the you know, fakes that are in the art world, etc. Mm -hmm. So provenance, that is knowing the chain of ownership from the creator to the most recent owner, is an important aspect of the trading of modern and contemporary fine art. And that, I think, is also the essence of the link between NFTs or blockchain um, generally and then art, is that, you know, when, you know, what kind of linked these, that was that what links these colored coins on Bitcoin to their link in art now, even though most NFTs are actually on the Ethereum blockchain, which is different from the Bitcoin blockchain. So, yeah, so this is why I think, you know, digital art is now being minted by artists and creators directly because now the provenance is trackable and it's fully visible to everybody on the chain. You can trace the transactions. So if you created an item and I bought it and then I sold it to somebody else, um, the, thir you know, the third person who might be buying it will be able to trace and see, oh, I see it, sold it to Karabo. I see I created it, sold it to Karabo, sold it to this third person. So when I'm buying it, I know it's Osea's original work. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. You know, I am just, I, I feel like I want to speak to you for like, four more hours like just give <laughs> me more insights into this world of art and and even this word provenance i'm like oh okay we're keeping the integrity of this item oh okay this is what and so my next question to you was actually going to be what are the benefits to the person right or the collector buying art through NFTs. And I feel like you've already touched on that so much um, with your previous explanation. But is there anything you would like to add as an added benefit to this collector who's chosen to use NFTs as, as a mode of, of purchase and protection and risk against provenance? So, yeah, I think, you know, let me start maybe with why people buy art in general. So most people buy art because, you know, of how it looks, right? Um, mm -hmm. You'll see a beautiful portrait, a painting. It might be, you know, a fantastic artwork. Um, and they think that it will complement their home or maybe their work environment or wherever they're planning to display it. And uh, some people buy also art to just support the creative arts, right? To support creators in general with, with what their craft is. Um, but there's also some people who might actually also accumulate you know, much wealth and so much wealth that they need to put it in different assets to diversify their wealth exposure. This is kind of also where the personal finance aspect comes in. So, you know, 
a person actually might buy a second house um, or buy land um, that they want to kind of improve on and, and help it become a, genera- a cash generating asset. You know, they may want to rent it out. Um, you may want to buy it in different places as well to diversify um, your risk. You may want to buy gold, you buy shares, you know, or they invest in investment funds, be it mutual funds or unit trusts or invest in private equity or venture capital. And they may want to keep their money in different currencies as well. So some people, you know, like uh, these Russian billionaires who unfortunately have been sanctioned now because of the, you know, the um, The invasion of Ukraine. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, they might have had different currencies because now basically they can't trade in the in the ruble because you know um, basically there's sanctions there. So some people then kind of do that type of thing. They will make sure that they have currencies in different places. And actually, sometimes it's just related to the fact that you want to send your kids to the US, and so you'll start building up reserves of US dollars because you need to find the fact that they need to go to school in the US. Um, and people also invest in cryptocurrency. Interestingly enough. Um, but they also invest in art, which is also another alternative investment. In fact, the 2020 Knight Frank Wealth Report indicated that ultra high net worth individuals based in Africa, so that's people with over $30 million in wealth, mm-hmm. had 4% of their wealth in collectibles. And um, when you break down that category of collectibles, that's like art, um, could be luxury watches, classic cars, or even luxury handbags, for example. And interestingly enough, from 2016 to 2018, African art market grew by 22% per annum. That's a very decent return, albeit that actually, yes, it's very volatile, as is the case with several alternative assets. So I think this is some of the things that people then apply in the digital space as well as it relates to NFTs, um, that they're buying art because NFTs because of this reason that, you know, they want to, yes, do it for their own enjoyment. They may want to use their NFT art um, as their profile on Twitter, or they may want to use their NFT art in the metaverse. You know, um, <laughs> you know, somebody created the likeness of an Hermes Birkin bag, and they he maybe wanted to do that. Although Hermes did subsequently, you know, sue them for for IP mm, uh, breaches. <laughs> yes, but um, yeah, so people kind of yes do it for their own enjoyment, but also as a diversifier. But I guess yes, it, you know, it's definitely advisable not to spend your life savings on it. So. And yeah, you know, the interesting part, which I guess um, is fascinating about the space as a new technology in a new area, is obviously there are some cynics who will say the craze in NFTs is being driven by people who hold a lot of Ethereum. Mm -hmm. And um, so they're exposed and they're trying to kind of just drum up and influence people in terms of these use cases and create the market for this Ethereum so that they can actually also, you know, sell out of the Ethereum and buy other things. Um, and create a value gap for themselves, supposedly to get super rich off it. So that's also some of the interesting things about like this, what the cynics say about NFTs and what's driving that wealth um, or driving kind of the craze in it. But at, at the same time, um, NFTs and blockchain in, in general has kind of implicit scarcity built into it. And that's why you just kind of see these wild prices going about and people selling kind of NFT art for crazy amounts. But that scarcity similarly actually happens with the art world, you know. Yeah. If you buy a painting or a print that's actually one of 50, that's going to be cheaper or lower price than buying something that's one of 10 or what's one that's a u- unique item. So similarly, that kind of dynamic price dynamic happens. But yeah, the benefits of kind of buying NFTs, I think, have been more so this issue of provenance. But, you know, lots of people love it for these aspects of the fact that they're supporting creatives in different ways as well. Yeah. Love, love to hear it. And I want to switch directions for a bit. Let's take it to Tabo, the artist, right? How can he make money through NFTs? Mm. And does capital art play a role in helping him value his pieces and his talent? Mm. So yeah, I'll, st- I'll start with the with the um, first question. So yeah, NFTs are minted directly onto the chain, mm-hmm. and I don't think at the moment there is kind of similar intermediation that occurs as it does with physical arts, like having representation by galleries, for example, who then also drive the investment in the artist and the marketing of their work. So artists mint their work directly onto the chain, 
and then they get the proceeds directly based on there being enough buyers who are interested in purchasing their art or if there's an auction um, or just w at whatever price is set by the, by the artist. Um, so that's kind of how an artist then captures value, right? Um, interestingly enough, South Africa has been one of the top trading markets for cryptocurrency. Nigeria is also up there. So potentially that means that, yes, there's opportunity for artists in terms of lots of people having this currency to buy their artworks. Um, I think there's also opportunity for African creatives in general because the traditional art markets in Europe of the, because the traditional art markets are in Europe and North America, but NFTs means that artists can tap into collectors from all around the world without needing to break into those traditional ecosystems. You know, not, you know, you don't have to know who are the art dealers in New York who are willing to kind of market your work to whoever are the people who are collectors in New York, for example, to access, um, you know, getting um, 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 that type of exposure. Um, and I, I appreciate that, yes, you know, social media and the pandemic also helped to expand the interest base of many social, of many artists. You know, lots of people were on Instagram and some people then sell directly, um, especially those artists who are then not based in these art markets, um, like in Europe and North America. And, you know, obviously, yes, the auction houses even similarly said they experienced like a massive growth in interest in African art over the pandemic because now they had online auction, auctions rather, rather than physical ones. So basically anybody around the world could be seeing these artworks bidding for them, whereas before, for you had to be at like you know the Sotheby offices in Bond Street in London to see these artworks, and if you were based in South Africa, you would have never seen seen these artworks or based in Tokyo or wherever type thing. So, so that's been something which I think has been interesting about um, that opportunity is that you know being decentralized. That's actually what um, assists. So, the one thing which I can I guess is always on my mind is just a key consideration on the downside is whether. You know, each African country is a big collector's market or not. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the jury is out on that, you know, not to the extent that you have like baseball cards are a massive collectible in the U.S. or just looking at NBA Top Shot. Top Shot, which created these NFTs of all these basketball players' key moments and games, you know, you kind of wonder whether we could replicate the same thing and or not, you know, and I, I kind of wonder about that. So maybe that's just to also highlight that, yes, it's probable that, you know, African artists can do really well in the NFT marketplace because there's all these people from around the world who may be looking at the art. Mm -hmm. But I think the jury is out on whether the, Afri the average, you know, South African or Nigerian is actually buying NFTs or not. And that's something which I think is worthwhile to take into consideration. But that's kind of the opportunity that is there in terms of an artist. Um, and yeah, I think, um, so at the moment, Capital Art No is not, it's a service for art collectors, not mm -hmm. for artists directly. So it's not, a platform for people who are using their art as as an item which is available for sale. It's not a marketplace. It's not it's where people can user. sell. Yeah. Yes, exactly. The end user at the moment is just for collectors for them to understand kind of this value. Um, but actually, you know, for collect for artists themselves, the platforms then go into um, you know that detail and they assist with with that type of thing as well. So you know that's where you could um, access it and. Yeah, I think it, it, it is exciting for these points that I kind of mentioned a bit earlier. A quick follow-up question. So mm. would you have to be an existing collector to come work with Capital Art or could you be um, an interested uh, interested in getting into the space and then come work with you to say, look, I have property, um, on, I have land, I have all of these other assets, but now I want to get in and save my money through the NFT um, digital art space. Can I come to you, Capital Arts? Yes, yeah, so we're not minting any NFTs, no. okay. um, but but um, what was really cool was, so in December when we launched our beta version, we launched a free version um, of the um, service. And so if you are somebody who I think is interested in art, it might be useful to um, to see kind of some of the things that collectors of art do. And like I, I always say, I think you're a collector from the first artwork that you buy. Um, and yes, at the moment, the platform is more focused on physical art, not digital art. But mm -hmm. I'm hoping that there will be developments to kind of integrate, um, you know, for people who are collectors of digital art as well. But yeah, I say, you know, if you are, um, you know, and, and a lot of people do ask this question of like, how do I start collecting art? 
And I think a very, especially if you are thinking about it for the long term, is, you know, spend the time going to visit galleries and going to art museums and getting a feel for who are the artists who are kind of well known. Um, I think galleries play an important role because, like I said, they invest in the artist and their career as well, support the artist from a marketing perspective. And that's really important is the more people kind of see and know a work, the more valuable it becomes, right? Mona Lisa is one of the most valuable pieces of art. You know, it's so hard to ensure it because, you know, it, can you really place a value on it based on the fact that it's so recognizable? And that's because everybody knows what it looks like. And similarly with art, I think it's important, you know, um, you start to kind of get a feel for who the artists are, but when people know, yes, the artist, but also specific artworks, that's also what drives value, especially if it's a unique item, because there's only one of it in the world that artists created at that point in time. It's very hard to replicate it and replicate what that journey, that piece of art has been through. So it is important to kind of understand that dynamic and then, you know, yeah, get to be familiar with who are the artists. And remember that, yes, you know, sometimes, yes, you'll see um, for the guys, everybody who's in South Africa and who's familiar, um, you'll see Nelson Makamo on the cover of Time magazine and you'll see Oprah bought one of his pieces and then, yeah, you see kind of the prices now and think, wow, that's like something I can't even afford. afford yeah. But actually, or <laughs> see, yeah, like basically the big thing to remember is that like in 2012, his works were selling for like 20,000 Rand and maybe that's an accessible price point. So remember that, you know, um, and he was one of the winners of like the Joburg Art Fair kind of young collectors, you know, young, young artist prizes and that type of thing. So even attending art fairs, I think is a great way to get a feel for who are the artists that are, you know, have been curated by people in the art world. But like I said, I appreciate, you know, that yes, you're not gonna then realize everybody and then maybe some great artists out there who will, um, you know, their prices kind of will appreciate, even though they might not be in, represented in the gallery system or be presented at art fairs and the like. But if you're somebody who has an interest in collecting, I think that's a great way to just get a feel for what are the artists like, who are the names, like, get a sense of the galleries out there, follow them on Instagram, get a sense of who they are that type of thing. And um, I think, yes, if you've bought one artwork, even if it's a small print, um, then, you know, using a platform like Capital Art to save all the documentation, you know, the documentation related to that purchase and the details around that artwork is then really important for you to start getting a feel for this is something I'm going to start doing long term um, because that's actually how you look after your art collection over the long period of long term making sure that you keep all the documentation and and like understand the story behind why you bought it because if at some point in time you may want to sell it i think sometimes the stuff that attracted you to why you bought it might interest somebody else in terms of why they might want to buy it and then that's mm. really important right mm -hmm. just from a demand and supply perspective if you increase demand that increases the price of an asset so um yeah those are some things to just think about in terms of being a collector and starting that kind of, um, you know, practice of making sure you're starting to do collection management, which is saving all the documentation related to the artwork and the history mm -hmm. around it. And when you see like literature about your artist, um, you know, save it as well, because that's also something to point to the fact that they are becoming more well known. Um, so those kind of things really drive the value then. Um, and I think, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And some of the things which, you know, one of the reasons why, um, I've been tracking NFTs. I mean, like like you heard, I've got like nothing to do with technology in my background. Yeah. <laughs> Not much to do with art except for a very big passion for it. But one thing which um, is really important to me is like um, diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, and in particular, inclusion of the creative arts. And what I really love actually about blockchain and in particular the Ethereum blockchain is that you can integrate smart contracts into it. So, you know, I first sort of hearing, started hearing about blockchain because of the smart contracts issue and its application in general insurance. But what I love about this is now a digital artist could actually, when they're minting um, their um, artwork, indicate in the smart contract to say, actually, every time this artwork is sold, I need to be paid royalties of 1%. Um, and that makes a very big difference because in the traditional art market that happens now in the physical art world, an artist may make a piece um, and, you know, like, you know, in the early part of their career, it sells for 5,000 Rand. But as they get more and more well known, that piece then might go through successive owners and at some point then be worth 20, you know, kind of, you know, you know, 1 million Rand or 2 million Rand. But that artist never benefits from that price appreciation and the mm. fact that that artwork trades at 2 million Rand because that piece 
was a unique piece. Um, even if they did something today, that the new piece that they create today might not have the same price and sell for the same price as this artwork that, you know, subsequently sold for two million rand. And the artist then never benefits from that value because people might not appreciate, you know, their current artwork in the same way as they appreciate this artwork that they made, like, you know, five, 10, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So what's cool about that is that the, the artist, I think it creates sustainability for the artists in the sense that they now benefit and get some sort of income off the secondary sales of their artwork. Um, you know, in the music industry, the concept of royalties is very well known, but in the art world, it's not there in relation to artwork that is kind of, you know, created and then sold. So that's one thing which I also really love about what, or I think in terms of an opportunity around NFTs, is just creating sustainability for the art artists themselves. And that's really, really important. Karabo, thank you. Thank you for educating us. Thank you for putting us on. If you are listening, I have changed my mind. I do not want birthday cards. I don't want flowers. <laughs> Buy me art. Yeah, that's good. Buy yes. me art. I want to quickly <laughs> run to Capital Art, sign up, get my paperwork done there. <laughs> Guys, don't waste time. Invest in things that are beautiful. Invest in things that are sure to appreciate. And we have people like Karabo and her team taking care of us and our investments. Mm. Okay. I, wanted, Go ahead. I wanted to mention maybe one more thing. I think for people, there must be artists who are also interested in, in getting into the space. Um, and the platforms themselves often have information to assist those who are interested. But I assume, yes, it, you know, it would be very daunting for somebody who's not familiar with digital art, not familiar with the crypto space. Because, yeah, you know, and I think also the other thing to be mindful of is, you know, when you, yes, mint this art, you'll be paid in crypto, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess this is the key question is like, if your house, if your, you know, your rent or you've bought this property and you're living in it and your, all your rates and taxes, you et cetera, sell it. Yeah. are in, well, they're in South African rands or, or Kenyan shillings and your life is in these currencies as well. What, what will you do when you get paid in Ethereum? You know, you can't go to your local supermarket and buy your weekly groceries in Ethereum yet. <laughs> so that's the thing which I think to just be mindful of. You know, I tried buying NFTs for the first time in May last year. And I think, yeah, there are these challenges for the average person accessing them in terms of some, I think, barriers. Um, or, yeah, how or do kind you of, liquefy yeah, it? How agree. do you switch it? Yeah. Exactly. Because, you know, you need to then find a crypto exchange to change your RANs or, you know, whichever currency into this crypto currency and making sure you buy the correct currency. Then transferring the cryptocurrency onto a crypto exchange wallet at the NFT marketplace wallet. And yeah, similarly, as an artist, you need to figure out, okay, yes, I, I create this digital art, I sell it to somebody, I need to now transfer my money from the marketplace to a crypto exchange to like a fiat off ramp where I can then change that money into rands or Nigerian Naira, which I use for my day to day living expenses. So those are some things to think about. But it is exciting to also have heard of two new African marketplaces. So there's one called Red Sand um, with web, uh, web address redsand.art. Mm -hmm. And the other one is The Tree, which has Trevor Stuerman as one of his co-founders. And that's um, the web address is thetreenft.io. Um, and that's obviously in addition to OpenSea and SuperRare, which people might have heard of as NFT marketplaces. So I think that's something which is interesting to think about. As a creator... You know, if you're thinking of listing, you may want to maybe first chat to artists who have actually been minting artwork there already. Um, chatting to artists who maybe were people who are making physical art who then transitioned to doing digital art. So the Capital Art Instagram feed, Capital Art Official, has three digital artists which have been featured on it. It's two South African artists and one Nigerian artist, so you could definitely check that out. Um, if you're interested in, you know, kind of experiencing some digital art, even if you're a collector, it might be useful to kind of see some of the things that are happening there from a digital art perspective. Um, and also South African artist Norman O'Flynn is also somebody who does both physical and digital art as well. So, you know, sometimes for anybody who's kind of maybe interested, those are some of the things to just Resources, check out and see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thank yeah. you so much for that. I feel like this has been so insightful. And actually... As we are closing off, I would like to give you a few more minutes to do a self-plug. What's something that you're excited about right now? What should people look out? And when you are closing off, let us know how the listeners can find you and get in touch with you. 
Okay, cool. Well, yeah, so I think yeah, some of the things that I'm excited about um, at the moment, I guess my focus is fully on capital art and growing the network of collectors and looking about exciting things to um, expose people. It's been really great. I mean, last year I had an awesome time. I traveled to Dakar um, and uh, to Senegal and got to get a sense of the art market there. And that's what I'm looking forward to is, you know, being a platform which is focused on really um, helping collectors of African art in the different um, countries work and understand why this is so important. Um, that's what I'm hoping to do is to travel to more countries, look at galleries, um, get a sense of um, whether this they think this is something they could also talk to their collectors is about because it's something that's going to really help the ecosystem in general but i think in particular help um collectors of this art ensure that they collect the value and not just the art you know um so that's what i'm really excited about um and it's been so exciting to talk to collectors and also see them have these aha moments about why this is so important and a lot of them kind of really get it instantly about the fact that they want to make sure they're they're investing for the long term um and investing for generations to come and that's i think um something which i, I excited me every day so that's what i've been loving to do um for anybody who's just interested yes you can follow capital art at capital art official on instagram mm -hmm. um my um twitter account is at garabu murule um i'm also on linkedin as well but yeah so those are the two main places and then obviously you can uh, find capital art online um the web address is capitalart.co so not .co.za or .com just .co okay Okay. Yeah. Ladies and gents, Karabo Murule, the co-founder of Capital Art. Thank you so much. She's been on here educating us, putting us on and encouraging us to look at art as an investment. I cannot wait to be a collector myself, but I think I am because I've bought one already. So, hey. Um, cool. I really, really, really appreciate you coming here. As we said, some of the stuff that we're talking about may sound new to you, but don't panic. This is why we are here. This is why we've chosen to put out an e-magazine, put out some content on the metaverse. What's going on there? What does digital art look like? And we're talking to professionals like Karabo to help us open up our minds and embrace this new phase of life. My name is Arasia Nyawadi. Look out for the issue coming out on March 28th. It's been lovely. Karabo, Asanti Sana. Thank you so much. Thank and you. cheers. That's it from us today. Bye.